Well, this is the exciting conclusion of what I think has been a very productive full day event here at CSIS, looking at how the United States can actually engage India on some of the important programs that the Modi government has initiated, uh, whether it's uh, skills development, uh, make in India, smart cities, and it's really a privilege and an honor to get to welcome Finance Minister Jaitley uh, to his first trip to Washington and indeed the United States uh, since taking over the role as Finance Minister of the Government of India. So here to introduce the Finance Minister is Dr. Ramesh Badwani. Do you want me to do it? Okay, okay. I'll take the honors myself then. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So, Minister Arun Jaitley holds three ministries simultaneously, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, and the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, which really is a strong sign of his abilities and the trust that Prime Minister Modi and his colleagues have in his intelligence and abilities. He already has made a strong mark on the finance ministry since taking it over less than a year ago, ushering in key fiscal reforms, such as devolving more spending, which got a lot of attention today in the program so far, to the states, lifting FDI caps in key sectors such as insurance, and maybe on the verge of a major domestic tax overhaul, the goods and services tax, which has also been the subject of much discussion today at the proceedings. A lawyer by training, Minister Jaitley rose to become a senior advocate before the Supreme Court of India, but drawn to politics, he became a national executive for the BJP back in 1991. During the last NDA government from 1998 to 2004, uh, he held a series of important portfolios in that government as well, including the Ministry of Law and the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. And even while his party was in opposition in the last 10 years, his party gave him important leadership positions, including as leader of opposition in the Rajya Sabha. So we warmly welcome to Finance Minister Arun Jaitley uh, to the stage here at CSIS uh, for his first remarks in the United States and taking over this role. Uh, Minister Jaitley, the uh, floor is yours, sir. Mr. Richard Rosso, Dr. Ramesh Badwani, Mr. Nainan, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I'm extremely delighted to be here during this dialogue conference that you have on deepening the U.S.-India commercial ties. And I've been asked to speak on India's demographic transition, the opportunities for partnership. But I do realize that the width of the subject uh, really would go much beyond uh, the normal parameters of a subject like demography. Well, India's working population, and if I take uh, the lower base of the working population literally increases by millions every year. One estimate is that uh, the population between 15 and 59 years was 58% of our population in 2001. And in 2021, it is expected to be about 64% of our population. So that broadly indicates that uh, the percentage of uh, younger working hands in India is unusually large. And therefore, it is uh, incumbent for any government, any political system to meet the challenge of providing jobs to these people, skills to these people, provide good health, good education so that they can be prepared for a much larger role in the years to come. How do we foresee over the next few years coping up with this challenge? I think the first obvious answer is that India's own normal in terms of its growth rate has to target anything close to a double digit. India growing at 5%, 6%, even 7% is not an India which is going to face up to this challenge. And I do believe that India has that potential to make 9 to 10% its new normal in the years to come. 
how do we reach that roadmap? And once we achieve that, to generate jobs for the ability of this uh, population is going to be, though challenging, reasonably possible. The roadmap which we've currently laid for ourselves, the first aspect of that is that we are very strongly strengthening all our regional, our state, provincial governments. Financially, we've seen an era where all our state governments literally had to run to the center for resources. Today, it's a different ballgame altogether. Conventionally, we have been speaking and paying lip sympathy to a commonly used phrase in India, which is cooperative federalism. But we actually now see it in action. In the new partnership between the center and the states, the revenue of the states has been hugely increased so that they can invest a lot more both in social infrastructure and physical infrastructure. They can invest a lot more in their poverty alleviation schemes. So each state this year onwards is going to get 10% more than what it did in the previous years. This has also led to another form of uh, federalism in India, which we've now started referring to as competitive federalism. State after state is competing with each other. They are competing to move investments. They are competing uh, to provide a better infrastructure. They are competing to create better universities, and so on. Now, that's, that's a process which is on. The second emphasis we've, which we've laid down is increased significantly our investment in infrastructure. In this year's budget itself, my uh, expenditure on infrastructure exceeded uh, uh, about $12 billion. Now, our main emphasis is to start rebuilding our national highways. It was a great program which was started when Mr. Vajpayee was in power. Last few years, it slowed down and slowed down significantly. And therefore, a lot of public investment is now being put both into the railways, both in uh, uh, national highways, in rural roads. In fact, one of the advantages that we've had of the lowering of the oil prices, that through a process of cess, we've converted a very significant part of the lowering of the oil prices. A lot of it goes to the, has been passed on to the consumer, but a very significant part which comes as a cess to the central government is being diverted into these three programs, rural roads, highways, and railway infrastructure. Our emphasis uh, on uh, manufacturing, because that's where the jobs are going to be. And therefore, the roadmap which the government has laid for itself is we've opened our doors for investment. Some of the sectors which had conventionally not been opened up uh, have been opened up, and by and large, it's been a welcome move in India. There are very few sectors now, uh, almost uh, uh, insignificant, which still remain closed. Everything has been opened up. Recently, in the last few months, we've taken the step of opening out insurance in a big way. We've opened our defense sector in a big way. We've opened up railway infrastructure, our uh, uh, real estate sector. Now, these were some of the sectors on which we had been conventionally conservative, but now these all have been opened up for investment. After having opened them up for investment, the next stage is when both domestic and international investors come in, how do we ease in our systems so that uh, investing in India itself becomes more attractive? There had been a legitimate complaint that between the time when an investor takes a decision to invest and the actual launch of his project, he has to run to dozens of offices. Uh, 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 there are many challenges before him. And therefore, the time spent in this itself may be a few years before he can actually start the process. Now, this is something which uh, I would say is still work in progress. We are trying to narrow down that period and therefore, 
I've, in fact, in this year, set up a new committee to look into the whole mechanism of how the whole institution of prior permissions can be replaced by a regulatory mechanism where it's far easier to start your business just complying with the guidelines which have been uh, stated in that area. As far as our taxation laws are concerned, there had been conventionally a lot of legacy issues. It had been a fairly hostile system, some people mentioned. In the last few months, I'll be speaking on it separately at a function tomorrow, so I'm not elaborating at this moment in detail as to the steps which we are taking to smoothen up the entire taxation system itself. There are sectors which we've opened up in a big way. Our mining sector, our coal sector, and the auctions which we've held in these areas have been a huge success. The entire possibility of anybody calling a decision of the government questionable itself has been completely eliminated. And hence, once these sectors and the manufacturing activity which results from these sectors, coupled with our emphasis on infrastructure, all this, uh, 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 over the next few years, we start seeing the result of all this activity in infrastructure and manufacturing. I have not the least doubt that from where we consider today around 8% growth, which we hope we are going to achieve this year, the ability to march forward towards that double-digit growth over the next few years is going to be reasonably possible. Uh, one of our very big challenges has been, and that's still a contentious issue, has been the land law in India, particularly the one which was uh, legislated in 2013. I have no hesitation in saying that the land law, if it remains in the present shape, is a hurdle to employment creation. In fact, one of the purposes, and I think that's one of the key purposes, uh, the most important one in terms of uh, using India's demography, is one particular provision in the land law in the context of the subject that I would like to point out. One of the areas where we are trying to ease in the acquisition process is what we call the creation of industrial corridors. Now, unlike uh, an industrial park or an industrial hub, an industrial corridor is a narrow corridor which runs along a national highway, which runs along a railway track, where you have industries on both sides of the road. Now, this is capable of providing employment to vast number of people in rural India. We currently have the Delhi-Mumbai corridor, which is being uh, built. It's 1,200 kilometers. You have the Calcutta-Amritsar, same distance which is being built. So you will have townships, smart cities, uh, industries running across this whole corridor. 300 million people in India are landless. And when we talk in terms of using India's demography, the urban people are capable of finding a job for themselves. The landed peasantry is capable of finding work for itself. But it is those 300 million landless, which is almost close to a quarter of India's population, for whom industrialization of the areas where they are staying in, that's the rural areas, and it is these narrow corridors which are capable of providing a big uh, 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 opportunity in these particular areas. And I see one of the biggest challenges of the land law which we are trying to amend, which is currently uh, uh, a lot an issue in India, would be this would be the net advantage of that land law if uh, it could be passed in the coming days itself. Our program to have um, 100 new smart cities in India. Now, we've uh, uh, seen the first experiment. Um, last week, uh, I had an opportunity to launch what is strictly India's first smart city. It's also a special economic zone, a financial sector hub in Gujarat, in Gandhinagar. And the financial model on which it has been built is where land and the right to build on that land we call it the FSI or the FAR in India, itself is being used as a resource. And that resource entirely is the state's investment. 
No more revenue from the state exchequers has been required. That's the financial model on which it has been built. And it's been an excellent success. Uh, the response to this has been uh, extremely good. Uh, it's something which is worth emulating. Our skill development program has just started. And I think it's the success of this program itself which eventually can take us in the direction of generating a huge workforce with a large potential for employment itself. The weakest sections of society in India, we've started a huge social security program, we call it the Janadhan uh, 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 program, where every economically deprived person who had no access to a bank, a banking facility he's been linked to. Today we are in the process of uh, cash transfer to his accounts, supported by a social security program itself, uh, which the government has launched in this current budget, which in the course of uh, some questions, if there's an opportunity, I'll try to explain in detail. The Indo-US uh, partnership, gradually it's reaching a new height. There's a huge amount of cooperation. And for each of these programs, we need a lot of investment, both domestic and international. And for each of these in the areas of skill development, in the areas of education, in the areas of infrastructure, in the areas of manufacturing, it is here if the investment starts coming in, I think uh, the entire issue of providing skills and jobs to this great workshop, workforce in India would be reasonably possible. Thank you. That is an impressive agenda of accomplishment so far and vision for what's coming up ahead. And I think the goal here in the United States from those of us in this room and involved in the policy community, whether it's from government or business or other groups, is to figure out what's the role that we can play? Because certainly India's growth is in our interest in so many ways. So um, the, the minister's got uh, opportunity to take a couple of questions here. Um, please, uh, you know, your name, where you're from, and keep it very brief. I'm gonna be very aggressive on that point. We don't want speeches, but we would like to get a few questions in. So uh, let me just uh, start, I see the first hand right over here. We've got a microphone coming up uh, behind you. Thank you, sir. That was a very lucid and very illuminating talk. I'm Pradeep Kapoor. I was ambassador of India in Cambodia when you visited in the previous government with Vajpayee. And I was there after ambassador of India in Chile. I was secretary to the government, and now I'm professor at the University of Maryland. Uh, sir, uh, my question to you is, what we feel from seeing the media in India is that a perception is being sought to be created uh, that there are many shortcomings, there are many problems with governance issues in India. Uh, how is the government planning to tackle this very serious issue? Because half of the aspect of development takes place when there's a good economic sentiment. So that is there, and the perception globally of the government is very good. So what are the steps that the government, in spite of all the great steps you have undertaken, the government has undertaken in so many different social sectors, economic yeah, I sectors. Think we, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, you sir. Take the microphone, yeah, perfect. Thank you. I think India is a country where uh, you'll have a lot of things happening at the same time. And therefore, in a country of India's size, which is almost a continent with a very large population, uh, you can have uh, even trends indicated which are not encouraging. You may hear some discordant voice somewhere. But that's not mainstream India today. In most parts of the country, the central government certainly, and I would say a very large number of states, there's a huge, huge change in priorities. And I think there's a growing feeling that the current both domestic and international situation is conducive for India's growth. For instance, if you uh, uh, asked an average Indian commentator uh, 
to comment on how India is doing today. The fact that we are this year, the year which has just concluded, our year ends on the 31st of March, and uh, we are likely to grow by 7, 7.5% in that range. So if you ask an average Indian co commentator, he won't tell you that it's, it's a great thing that has happened. The, 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 the feeling still is, this is not our real potential. There are still many, many things which we can do, as I just indicated. And when the net impact of an improved manufacturing sector, net impact of uh, larger investments in infrastructure, better social infrastructure, uh, uh, unleashing our entire potential uh, uh, through mineral-based industries, something which we are trying to unleash now. Once all this is realized, uh, uh, one of the important steps uh, which I intend uh, to conclude in the coming week, weeks itself in the, uh, in the next three weeks when the parliament session is on, is the goods and services tax. Now, independent observers believe that that itself is capable of pushing up India's GDP anywhere between 1 to 2 percent. Now, all this is quite capable of taking us close to what we thought we could never reach. And today, there is a realization that's a realizable target. Yeah, right there in the, uh, in the, in the alley, the aisle. Thank you, Minister. Krishna Guha with Evercore Partners. I was particularly interested in your discussion on the importance of manufacturing as a source of job, high quality job growth in India going forward. Now, of course, historically, small scale reservations on the one hand and uh, restrictive labor laws on the other have been seen as some of the disincentives for large scale investments in manufacturing in India. Could you comment a little bit on how your government intends to attack those problems going forward? You see, the, the whole institution of uh, erstwhile reservations is now substantially diluted. Uh, one of the reasons uh, we have to keep our emphasis on uh, helping the small-scale entrepreneur, because considering the size of India and its population, there's a very large section of self-employed who are involved in those trades, businesses, manufacturing. A recent census showed that it's almost 5.77 uh, 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 crores, which means uh, uh, if, if you translate it into number of families, it will almost mean 20% of uh, uh, Indian families are involved in this self-employed business, uh, which, which, which has no sources of uh, external funding, it's, et cetera. We've, we've launched one of the schemes uh, a few days ago, which I'd announced in the budget, called the Mudra Bank, where we are trying to fund this unfunded section. And therefore, this is a workforce which has to be involved. Now, unless I can have structured, uh, medium, and large-scale uh, manufacturing, which involves each one of these, uh, there is no way I can um, uh, have any policy or the government can have any policy which uh, hurts this interest, which is self-employed. Now, having said this, amongst various reforms, labor laws will remain a challenge. Now, a particular formulation has come about where I mentioned in the opening comments uh, with regard to competitive federalism. Now, in some of the more progressive state governments have started, we, we've made some amendments. I won't say they're very significant. But some state governments have started asking for some very significant amendments. Now, earlier, the central governments used to say no, because it requires concurrence of the center, uh, because it's otherwise clashing with the central law. <coughs> Now, we as a policy decided that every state government which asks for an amendment to its labor laws to by and large agree to that request. Now, we've agreed to those requests. So a new formulation in that is being worked out. Now, the effect of this is going to be you'll probably have uh, sets of states which have more progressive labor regimes. And therefore, as a part of cooperative federalism, those who don't reform will have to compete with them. Great. I think we have time for, uh, for one more. So uh, allow me to, uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, back over on the side there. Gentlemen, yeah, right on the other side of the uh, row there.
Thank you, Minister. You talked about one leg of the infrastructure stool being uh, roadways for the industrial corridors. What is your roadmap for investment in infrastructure for potable water and power to those industrial corridors? You see, as far as uh, uh, power is concerned, last few months uh, we, we made important strides. We made strides both uh, uh, in renewable energy, because our renewable energy program being a cleaner energy is, is a very large one. And therefore, we've set a very important roadmap for that. Uh, as far as uh, other conventional energy is concerned, the non-renewable, which is coal-based, uh, it has its own pitfalls, but currently there is no solution out of it because a large amount of India's potential uh, was based on, on the coal-based power itself. Now, availability of coal was a problem because that had been stalemated in India on account of the process of allocations. Now, that's something which has been resolved. And therefore, power availability over the next few years is going to hugely increase. Uh, water is still a challenge. Water is a challenge uh, more particularly even for agriculture. And in fact, one of the areas uh, where we could grow, uh, besides industry, is also agriculture. Because uh, states which have done well in terms of the irrigation programs, which have domestically balanced it with ecological considerations, have ported, uh, um, uh, transported water from one part of the state to another, connected different rivers, etc., are states which have done exceedingly well. For instance, one of the states in the central India I visited that state uh, uh, last week, uh, and I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, its agricultural growth has gone up, Madhya Pradesh, to 18 to 20 percent because of transportation of water from one part of the state to the another. Now, it is these kind of uh, creative schemes which are being worked in several parts. If I have more resources at the center, which I think with increased growth rates, my revenues are going to go up, one of the areas on which uh, in the next one or two years I in intend to make a concentrated investment in is this whole business of uh, transportation of water, which is going to help irrigation and perhaps will also eventually uh, help other areas where water would be required. Uh, Finance Minister Jetli, uh, on behalf of the Vadwani Foundation, CSIS, and our friends at Anand Foundation, want to say thank you for coming here. Uh, I think everyone is impressed by the progress we've made in the last 10 months since the new government came to power. Uh, earlier this morning, uh, I uh, made some remarks to the uh, audience here about how impressed I was when I met Prime Minister Modi in September when he was in New York. And two of the topics we talked about, one was the fact, back to the issue of the demographic dividend, uh, India needs to create something in excess of 25 million new jobs over the next five years. And the practical reality is that in the previous five to seven years, we only created 2.7 million net new jobs though there were huge shifts in the unorganized sector between agriculture and construction. Now, since uh, there are many different ways in which one can create new jobs, uh, certainly one of them is the kind of cooperation with the U.S. that we have been talking about today. And I think there's an opportunity here to double the FDI from the U.S. to India. Uh, total FDI to India is 30 to $35 billion a year right now. Uh, perhaps we can set a goal of 75 billion for five years from now and come up with specific industry by industry uh, uh, initiatives to drive that doubling of FDI because that will go a very long way towards supporting Make in India, supporting smart cities, supporting job creation in India. And then on the Indian side, I think more could be done by way of innovation in small businesses, because that is ultimately the biggest growth driver in India. We have, as you said, many millions of small businesses, but most of them 
are not innovative. So other than the family, they don't hire too many other people. To fill 25 million jobs, we need hundreds of thousands of new entrepreneurs. We need a million or two million businesses, adding five or 10 employees each. And when I was there in February, uh, our foundation has formed partnerships with four of the ministries in India, and the signs are very encouraging. So I want to thank you. I want to thank the Prime Minister. Just keep the momentum going, speed it up, and nothing would please all of us more than to see India's FDI double and 25 million jobs get created. Thank you. Um, um, in, uh, in closing, I'd like to first thank the Finance Minister for being here with us today, despite his very busy schedule in Washington. Um, you've, you've heard what he has to say, and it's clear the government has a clear agenda. Uh, it's focused on getting the job done. And in Mr. Jaitley, we have somebody who's got clarity of mind, lucidity of expression, and is leading the attempt to get the economy on to double-digit growth. Uh, we've been here from the morning. Uh, we've had many panelists, uh, many speakers. I'd like to thank them all. Some of them are present here. Mr. Panda, the finance secretary, was here, uh, and several speakers from the corporate sector and uh, knowledge partners. So I'd like to thank CSIS for organizing this, Rick, for all the efforts that you put in, uh, Mr. Wadwani, uh, for your partnership in this and your leadership. And uh, to say thank you all for being here. Uh, it's been a rich day, and I'm sure we all have takeaway thoughts that will stay with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll have a reception up on the veranda to follow, too, so please join us for, uh, for a reception back there.